Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Ted Gardner. <clears throat> I'm an interviewer for the Library of Congress Oral History Project. And it's my honor and pleasure to have uh, Mr. Mac Lee with us today. Um, have the opportunity to hear his story. And uh, you know you'll get a DVD of this interview so that you'll always have, uh, or your family will always have uh, remembrance of that for you too. Um, where were you born, Mac? I was born in Springfield, Ohio. Uh-huh. Yeah. And uh, tell us a little bit about your family. Well, that's, uh, first you say I was born in Springfield, Ohio on December the 18th, 1922. Mm-hmm. And I was one of two of my family, which I had only had a sister, no brothers. My mother and father came from the deep south of Alabama. And my father came to Springfield on his way to either Detroit or Cleveland. But he found Springfield and he liked the little town. And we met up with a family by the name of Patterson, C.M. Patterson, who was a leading funeral director and mortician at that time in Springfield. Hmm. Rented a room and then brought my mother and sister uh, into Springfield and made it a home. Then I was born there. Did you get your education in uh, Springfield? Yes, I attended, well, I finished Springfield High School. At that time, we only had the one high school in uh, January of 1941. And during my school years and growing up, my father was a masonry contractor. And instead of going to, to Sandlot Baseball or pulling weeds or mopping <laughs> the kitchen floor at summer vacation, I went to carry a brick hod with 24 brick in a little tin trough on my shoulder, as much as three scaffolds high, up about 15 foot in the air, <laughs> and mixed mortar for the men who laid the brick. I took care of two bricklayers and if you wanted your bricks standing up, I stood them up. If you wanted them laying down, I could lay them down. And hmm. I didn't weigh but about 130 some odd pounds. And people talked about it was hard work and I was going to break myself down. But what I was doing was starting my apprenticeship in my trade, which was later I became a journeyman bricklayer. Wow. And I'm now a 50-year gold card international union bricklayers and allied craftsmen hmm. member. Well, that's uh, that's that's quite a quite a background. How well, I can go on and on with background. <laughs> well, yeah. we want to get uh, along here when, okay. and, and well, get your I, war stories, you know, and because that's. Uh, you're a treasure, and we want to uh, preserve that forever. Um, so you finished high school in 41. That was just uh, five months before Pearl Harbor. Yes. Um, I finished high school in 41. Mm -hmm. I went into service March of 43. <laughs> <laughs> and I went in as a private. Where, where, did you, where did you join up? Well, first I went to Fort Thomas, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And from there, by rail, we went to Campo, California, mm. which is, according to the Atlas map now, is an Indian reservation. But at that time, it was Camp Lockett, California. Eight, uh, California, 16, uh, that was the <laughs> zone numbers. Uh -huh. 
Camp Lockett, 16, California. Uh, 16, California. Well, and I was a private in the horse cavalry. Hmm. And that was in 1943. I was uh, singled out as to be a company clerk because I was capable of using a typewriter, mm -hmm. whereas so many of my uh, associates had no uh, high school education. They came out of New York, New Jersey, and else other places. But I was fortunate enough to leave Troop C, uh, the Horse Cavalry, and go into the headquarters detachment as military intelligence clerk, S2. Oh my. Well, that horse cavalry didn't last very long after you yeah. got in, did it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I had to go through my basic training as a horse cavalry. Sure. And then to our sadness, uh, in 19, well, it was, October the 21st of 1944, I received my Good Conduct Medal, and shortly um, thereafter we were scheduled to go overseas. And they deactivated our outfit, which was the 28th Cavalry. Uh, baby sister of the famous 10th Cavalry of the 2nd Cavalry Division, mm -hmm. all black outfit, except for the officers. And they deactivated the 2nd uh, Division Horse Cavalry. And we went into service troops. I was fortunate enough to get into Quartermaster Battalion 127. Mm -hmm mobile. And once again, I was in the headquarters detachment and was a military intelligence clerk, which at that time I didn't, at first I didn't realize what it meant to be in the military intelligence. And my first knowledge of it, I thought when I looked over at Lloyd L. Green, and he was a master sergeant, intelligence sergeant, I thought he must be the smartest person in the outfit. <laughs> I had no idea what the military intelligence meant. But I stayed in the uh, quartermaster detachment, 127 until sometime in 1944, I went to 117 Quartermaster Battalion. Now, where, did, where, where were you training then at that time? North Africa, and from North Africa, we went into Naples, Italy. And we operated uh, out of a little area called Frater Major, Cap Tacino, Frater Major, and Naples. Oh, well, down I the see. southern part of the boot. But where, where was where was your training camp in this in the states before you went overseas? In hmm? in Campo, California. Oh, it was all was, all out in California. Which was the Mex on the Mexican border. Right, right. Bahia, California. Oh yeah, San near San Diego. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's where well, we that, go. That, San Diego on our path. That's very interesting. I hadn't heard. Um, um, one other story I'd like to say right now, since you mentioned San Diego, you know, each one of us say that we have a guardian angel. Well, one particular time, I found out what it meant to have a guardian angel. Mm -hmm. I missed my bus from San Diego back to the camp. And knowing that I would be AWL after without leave, I couldn't afford that, so I decided to walk and hitchhike. Huh. As I was going along the highway, 
I heard the chirping sound, and it was a bobcat down the, the lower part of the highway coming across, and I didn't have a pocket knife, <laughs> so I started to throw in rocks, and the cat continued to walk along, and I knew that eventually this highway would come to a fork where where the cat was he would be where I was on the same level and we would meet. Huh. And a lady came by and stopped her car and said, Soldier, are you going to camp? And gave me a ride. Oh about that. But I can just see myself being torn in the thread <laughs> by this cat. And that was my guardian angel. Oh I should say so mm -hmm. well that that's a remarkable story and uh <coughs> also prepared you for a nice long life and an interesting life now so you're you're you got into the quartermaster outfit mm -hmm. and that was when you were in north africa no we didn't stay in north africa too long just long enough to uh I think they called it Port of Debarkation, uh -huh. where the uh, first thing we did, they marched us in from the railhead into the camp, and it was a large mountain, and at the base of this mountain, which seemed to be made out of a dark red rock, is where we would bivouac or camp overnight. And we noticed that various ones were picking up the rock. But we were young soldiers and didn't know. We were moving the rock out <laughs> so that we could sleep on the ground. And about three o'clock in the morning, the storm came in. And that next morning, those that had the rocks were laying up bone dry and we were soaking wet. Oh, boy. So that was lesson number one. <laughs> Next, we left there and went into Italy. And when we arrived there, instead of sleeping on the ground, we went to a camp. And in the camp, we had barracks. And the barracks were equipped with chicken wire that you slept on, suspended. Huh. No blankets or anything. That way we didn't pass on, you know, like uh, germs or bugs or whatever. Right. And we slept on this chicken wire. For heaven's sake. So the next day you got up and you had all the imprint of the wire right. embedded in your body. <laughs> and then from there, Easter morning, we were at Camp Lockett, California, and the big big eye horses came in and down we had to go to the train and unload the horses and some of the fellows had never seen a horse except the milkman or somebody right. coming out of the city of new york or, and they didn't already know which end the horse to lead out <laughs> and there we were with all these remounts we brought the horses out and put them in the uh, campground. And then we were all tickled to death because we were all going to have horses. And a couple of days later, we had our horses made of wood. <laughs> and we learned how to put the saddle, the blanket, the saddle, and the cinch on the wooden horse. Right. And we learned how to mount the war, the military style of how to mount the wooden horse. <laughs> and that went on for about a week or two. And then we went into infantry training. 25 mile hike was the end of that. Yep. And no one told you what shoes to wear. But you knew when you got back, you should have wore the GI shoe instead of your moccasin because you had blisters all over you. 
<laughs> and from then on, it was meet your horse. And we met the horse. <laughs> and we cared for the horse. And we cleaned every part of the horse that he couldn't clean himself uh -huh. by the number. Rub down and everything. Every part <laughs> of the horse by the number. How about that? And we learned by the number to come from the head all the way through to the, to the tail. <laughs> and then we were able to learn the near side was the side that you mounted. And you had a blanket. And you rode the horse on the blanket, if you could stay on. Did you ride the horse? Yes, I could ride the horse because in Springfield, we often times on Sunday would go to the fairground and rent a horse as a group. Mm -hmm. We'd rent horses to ride for our entertainment. But I didn't ride military style. And I didn't know how to ride military style until right. I went in the cavalry. And uh, I'd never seen a saddle like what we rode. Really? On. The saddle we had in Springfield was a nice smooth saddle. In the military, you had a saddle which was split down the middle. And sometimes you wonder whether he's better off walking or riding. Mm -hmm. But Lieutenant Martin, who took our group out, would always, after so many miles, three, three to five miles, you would hear him to give a command to dis, uh, get ready to dismount. And he would always say, if you smoke, the lamp is lit. If you smoke, if you got them, if you don't, watch me. Yeah. Yeah. Most of the time when you got off, yours was too wet from being in your pocket. It's <laughs> <laughs> the only thing you could do was watch him smoke. I couldn't even. <laughs> well, did you ever get thrown by a horse? Yes, I was thrown by a horse, but uh, not that type of horse. Not that no. type, right. You see, as I stayed in the service, <clears throat> I was a private. They had me booked for company clerk, and I was fortunate enough to get out of that mm -hmm. by, <laughs> as we went through on the rail, we stopped in, uh, we went across Texas, and we stopped in Kansas, and I went in the souvenir shop, and I bought a book called The Officer's Guide. And during the crossing of Texas on the rail, I was in this book. And it told what a junior officer, how to sleep, how to report, and this and that. So as I was saying, and we got to Camp Lockett, being the baby sister of the tent, they were the fellows that were there to train us to become a separate unit. Mm -hmm. Once we were trained, and had the unit formed, they moved back to their original outfit, and we had a 28th Cavalry. Mm -hmm. Well, the first sergeant, Sergeant Phillips, would call the roll. And I noticed that the fellows would get up at Reverie and run to headquarters. Some come back and some didn't. So I had a friend in Cincinnati. His name was Alden A. McLeod. He was a real estate broker in Cincinnati, had an office on Madison Road across from Win uh, Widmer's at that time, prior to coming in service. Alden and I met when I attended radio school at uh, Signal Corps Radio School on 6th Street in Cincinnati prior to going into service. Mm. Well, Sergeant Phillips called these names and the people couldn't come back, and I didn't know what was going on, but I, I didn't know they had me booked for to become the company clerk, or I was going to make corporal. So that morning, Sergeant Phillips called the names, and he said, Alden A. McLeod. 
And McLeod got up, run. I jumped up too, and I ran too. I'm not going to lose my friend. <laughs> so when I got there, I didn't realize that the person there would have the same list. But when I stood in the hall, waited, and they called them by their name, and they went in. Some come out smiling and went to this way, and some went back to camp. So McLeod come out, and he said, oh, I can stay. I'm in message center. He worked at the post office prior to so he got in message center. All of a sudden, I looked around, and I was the only one standing there. So I remembered my book, The Officer's Guide, and I knocked on the door. And I heard the voice say, come in. And I walked in, and Lieutenant Colonel Kilburn was seated. And I walked in, and I snapped my heels together, stood at attention, and threw the salute on, and he returned my salute as an at ease trooper. And he was puzzled, for what do you want to know? And I was reporting as directed, sir. He didn't have my name. But he said, well, what do you, um, is there anything, he told me what they were doing, they formed a headquarters group. Is there anything you might consider? I use a typewriter, sir. Oh, that he got up it. and then he took me down and I looked at this place and there was Gloyd L. Green, Master Sergeant, Bright, Operations Master Sergeant, Sergeant of Rare, Sergeant Major, all these Master Sergeants and one Buck Sergeant and a guy sitting over here with a typewriter but he didn't have any rank young guy, and he was just grinning from ear to ear, because here I come, I would be with him, you know. <laughs> His name was Bill Chavis out of Columbus, Ohio. And Bill had a typewriter and typing. So they told me, took me over to the military and told me to introduce me to Lloyd L. Green and so be the clerk. So, you know, Sergeant Thomas brought me a typewriter over there. Now is the time for all good men to come to the aid of the party. Right. I could never get to the party. I skip, skip, skip. <laughs> well, Jay was sitting there. And he looked at me and tip, skip, skip. All of a sudden, he sounded like a machine gun. Ba boom, ba boom. <laughs> About 60 words a minute, you know. There I am. I can use. I didn't tell you type. I said I could use a typewriter. <laughs> anyway, I stayed there as a clerk, and they made me the clerk. All right. And you got promoted. And I, I stayed there. I made instead of corporal, I made T four sergeant. Yeah. Javis and all was made at the same time. That was great. Oh. That's the one twenty seven. As later on, as I went through. Um, be I was detached to headquarters, but they knew I came out of C Troop, which was a rifle troop, and had my infantry training. Mm. So they chose me then to represent them for the show off with all these big high officers, all the field officers. And they rode the horses down that day, and we waited, and we went through everything to show them what we learned in basic training. That was in the morning. The afternoon was a creeping and crawling time to show them how we could take the rifle and go from here and under this barbed wire and whatnot. And what did they do? They, the, they sit on their horses and waited for it to rain. And it poured down rain in California. Mm -hmm. And then we went through the creeping and crawling. That was our reward. <laughs> Mud from here to there. Sure. And got back late after child time, nothing to eat. That's what we got for being great representatives. But that went on. Um, and I went through it all. But I cut this off. I went from T4 sergeant to Master Sergeant, Battalion Sergeant Major. Good for you. I was Boy, in the Army from March, 
I think about the 3rd of March, 43, till the 15th day of December of 45. And I went from private to sergeant to sergeant battalion major and was discharged honorably as the master sergeant discharged. Well, that, that's just uh, that's a remarkable story uh, because, of course, at that time, <coughs> the cavalry was, uh, at the beginning of the war, the cavalry was very important. And then later on, as the war progressed, you found that uh, the horses were going to be replaced by tanks and, mm -hmm. and cars and so forth and so on. Motorized mm -hmm. cavalry. Yeah, but you know, with the advantage that I had, at that time, the Army was segregated. Yeah. And so, when I walked in there, coming out of Springfield, I took a commercial course in high school. And in order to um, graduate, you had to type 35 words a minute. Mm -hmm. That's what the government wanted. Yep. But I hadn't seen a typewriter since I don't know when, and I told them I could use a typewriter. And that's what I was doing, using it. <laughs> but I stayed with it, and they accepted me, and I couldn't type. ASDF. Well. <laughs> but uh, finally, operations and intelligence got together, and Chavis did the typing for the operation, which was a training program every week. And I ran the memograph machine uh -huh. and sent the copies down to the message center to go to the troops. Right, right. So it worked out. And then I stayed with them. And then I transferred from there to the 117th Quartermaster Mobile um, in the uh, northern part of Italy. And the rotation started for going, people going home. But prior to that, they made they had no job for me. I was excess, so they made me the court martial clerk, <laughs> and I become the lawyer <laughs> <laughs> for all the guys that were in the black market, yeah. get waiting on a court martial. I would advise them, "Hey, you better get rid of that black market market money because you're gonna get some time, so and so and so, you know." And Next thing you know, uh, from the rank of T4 sergeant, the rotation came around and they passed it on to me as a battalion sergeant major, and I had the outfit. <laughs> <laughs> well, that that is a remarkable story because mm -hmm. you hit the uh, you hit the top of the top of the line yeah. in uh, non-coms. But the reason for it was. For two reasons. Number one, I was fortunate at that time that we had an integrated, I mean, we didn't have the integrated system. And I was fortunate enough to come out of a little town like Springfield compared to the guys that came out of the cities. Right. New York and different places, you know. Right. And we all being the same race, I was able to go back into that book. Right. The officer's guide. Isn't that something to and find that book? <laughs> I did, and then when I came out of that, I was enrolled in Whittenburg College, business administration. Well, what what do you recall about uh, you're going overseas? You went over on a ship. Went over on the maiden voyage of Billy Billy Mitchell, oh. maiden voyage, mm -hmm. and we were tr chased uh, one night all down the, around Bermuda. And you could hear the, the uh, depth charges uh, as they would lower them. And at one time, we were to abandon ship. Mm. Uh, we were ordered to line up for abandonment of the, the ship. And that's when you reach your canteen and find out you don't have any water. Oh, my golly. Not a drop of water, because you've been laying up there in the bunk, drinking the water. Huh. Now you got to get off the ship. You know, all this water and nothing to drink. <laughs> but luckily, they ran, outran these subs, went all down around Bermuda, and we didn't have to come off the ship. Yeah, well, I'll bet you were pretty uh, 
was pretty uh, wary of that. <laughs> yeah, it was Those frightening. submarines were pretty <laughs> bad. Well, um, Mac, did you, um, then where, where did you disembark after you crossed the ocean? In North Africa? Well, yes, we were uh, Casablanca. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's where we hit. But you know, um, when we got off, we didn't get to see much of uh, North Africa because it was it was too strict on us. Now the only thing we saw was every evening was the big man of the tribe or whatever walking all his wives, mm -hmm. and all his wives were walking in front of us, and here he come, you know, <laughs> and we'd line up to watch that. Right. But other than that, we didn't stay there that long, and. And of course, you think about a place like Casablanca, you want to see this, you want to see that. But we didn't get to go out. Did you get, uh, did you say you la you landed in Sicily, did you? Or no. did you go direct to Italy? No, I went straight into uh, Naples. Naples, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, then what outfit were you attached to in uh, Italy? Italy, I went in at 127. So 127th. Mobile. And then I transferred from that when we went into northern, it, we left there, southern part of Italy. We were in a little place called Cap de Kino, and from Cap de Kino, Fra Fra Maggiore, and then Cap de Kino, and Naples way down there. Uh -huh. And we left uh, Fra Maggiore area and went through Rome into Milan. And my face uh, froze. I rode on top of one of the trucks, and uh, of course I couldn't drive. Yeah, I could drive, but uh, since I was uh, headquarters, I wouldn't right. drive no truck. <laughs> <laughs> and I rode on top of the truck, <laughs> and one side of my face froze. I remember <laughs> that. Goodness sakes! Well, now uh, <clears throat> Rome was liberated. We we captured Rome. Uh, I don't know if many people are aware of this or not, but uh, Rome was secured by the Allies mm -hmm. the day after the landings in uh, Normandy. And of course, the, the landings in Normandy just wiped out the mm -hmm. importance of uh, oh, really? Mark Clark and his army moving north. Mm -hmm. Now, when, when you got up to Milan, what from there, when did you, where did you go? No, from Milan, uh, we, we were above Milan, and that's when uh, our rotation started of uh, people dropping back, coming home. Oh, I see, and okay. And then I was sent back to, uh, I went to Naples to a, uh -huh. a camp. So this was in 45 then, huh? This was in early part of 45, yeah, because when I got to this camp, I was a battalion sergeant major with master sergeant. Mm -hmm. And when you hit that camp, you everybody was the same rank. Didn't matter whether you were private, whatever. I had never walked guard. <laughs> but coming out of headquarters, I took a group of passes because I was authorized at that time to sign the colonel's name. Mm. And you know, about being the battalion sergeant major. I could take, I could either use the captain, uh, who was the adjutant, or I could use the colonel on a pass. So I took some passes, and when the food truck would come in, I hid, would hide behind the tailgate and get through the gate. Then I was in, uh, in uh, Naples. And I came in one day, and my name was up on the board for walking guard. <laughs> and I went in and talked to the master sergeant there, who was sergeant major. And I put yourself in my place. I said, <laughs> I put a plea on him, and he just shuffled it off <laughs> because he could have made issue out of it. Yeah. And I could have been reduced and court martialed. Wow. Uh, right there as I was coming home. <laughs> I was just fortunate. I, Hey, it's, it's over. Going. It's over. I'll straighten right. down. <laughs> well, then, uh, <clears throat> then did you go into France? No. 
Yeah. We got ready, you know, they, they got prepared us for it, and we put us on certain rations that we were going to be short of and all that. But we didn't have to go to, we didn't have to go in France. We didn't leave it. Did you talk about being shipped over to the Pacific and fighting Japan? No, because uh, uh, some of the uh, black outfits, that some fellows I knew in these outfits, they were going on to the Pacific. And guys out of Springfield that I knew and all. And we'd run into each other. And they well, why aren't you all going, you know? And I thought, man, I'm going home. <laughs> <laughs> you <laughs> had I, the points. <laughs> I, I was uh, in the rotation because sure. I got in with the 117. Sure. The 117 was one of the first quartermaster outfits over there. And they were moved to go home. Mm -hmm. And I was a 117 battalion sergeant major. And the first time it came up, I turned it down. And Captain Soto was the adjutant. And the second time my name came up, and he said, if you go home now, you'll be home by Christmas. Wonderful. And that was wonderful. Wonderful. And the reason, I was living so good. <laughs> <laughs> I had a command car, a motorcycle, um, what that trailer be like a pickup truck they call it weapons uh -huh. carrier. All those vehicles, Jeep, all that yeah. at my disposal. Anything I want to pick up, just pick it up. Pick up a motorcycle, ride in Naples, do wherever I want to go, anything. Wow. Sign my own passes, do whatever you know. <laughs> I had my own room in the barracks. I had a stereo set. Four o'clock in the morning we'd have a party, cook eggs. That's about all we could cook, you know. We'd cook eggs at 4 o'clock in the morning and have the girls business and whatnot. <laughs> I didn't want to go home. No. I mean, you know, Nothing good was time. good. <laughs> and when I got home, I talked to my dad, and he told me, he said, well, you got home. He said, uh, the Army uh, is a place for boys that don't have any home to go to, and you come on out. And I, I come out, but I hate to give up them. <laughs> Did you take advantage of the GI Bill? Yes, I, I went in, uh, went into Wittenberg as uh, business, business administration. Uh huh. And then I transferred from there to Howard University, Washington D.C. Uh, School of Architecture. In, in what? School of Arch Architecture. Architecture. Wow. And then, uh, Good for you. I came out of that and um, I went to work for uh, Wright Patterson Air Force Base. And second time, the first time prior to going, I had been to radio school. Mm -hmm. And they, before I was drafted, I went to Wright Patterson Air Force Base in the radio lab. Well, I went back to Wright Patterson Air Force Base. And this time, I was a building construction inspector general. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, people don't realize it. But some people say, why don't you write a book? You see, I can talk. Yeah. So why don't you write a book? Well, see, I got tired. Uh, I worked for my dad. And I got tired that a lot of times, even down to maybe a half a day on Christmas morning, we mm. got to go down and, and get this stuff cleared out, get yeah. the scaffolding and all that, uh, stock up this for next year or uh, next week. Or, I got tired of that. And I was a German bricklayer, but I did the labor work too because of my dad, you know. And uh, we were union, mm -hmm. and he paid me just like anybody else, but I still lived at home. And so in order for me to come home, I put in an order for every U.S. car made. Really? Wow. I wanted a car. Sure. And the person came in with a Ford. Oh, boy, I just... My dad said, no, you don't want that. Well, I didn't know why I didn't want that. <laughs> then, in March, after waiting all this time, from December to March, the Buick convertible came in. Mm -hmm. And he bought me a brand new Buick convertible. Boy. $2,300. Oh, no. Gave it to me in March. Wow, what a wonderful gift. First day, of, uh, first Saturday in May, going to the Derby, I tore the whole left side off of it. Oh my golly! Yeah, 
And I was working on the hospital at Wright Patterson Air Force Base for a company out of, of Columbus, Land Britain. And I got word from Washington that my job at the Corps of Engineers was at such and such a place, and this, 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 this. So <laughs> there I am. Well, the fellow from uh, the company I was working for out of Columbus. They came down, they hid my tools, and, you know, carried my tools out and whatnot. Anytime you need a job, you know, come back. I quit my job. Flew out to Washington to make this, uh, at first I called. Got an extension of time to take care of some business. All right. Then they day I'm supposed to be there, I flew out there the night before, and the next day I went in. I walked in this place, Corps Engineers. And nobody in there but this man way back there. And he's sitting back there with his feet in the bottom desk door. I didn't know. It. I walked in with a little blue suit on, white shirt, you know, mm -hmm. ready for this job. He like, hey, uh, you want something? <laughs> well, I figured his voice didn't sound right or something. So instead of me answering, I walked all the way back down to it. I looked down there and he had a manila folder, had on there Mac Lee. Now he's sitting there waiting on me, you know. I said, I'm Mac Lee. He almost fell through the desk door. <laughs> <laughs> he looked up, I blah, 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 blah. Said, uh, Since I talked to you, uh, there's been some changes, you know, this, that. I was sick. Huh. I quit my job. Everybody knew I was going to Washington to work with Corps Engineers, and there I am. Well, the lady that took me to the place was waiting on me in the car because she worked at Pentagon, and she was going to make sure, you know, I'm all right, and before she went on back to her job at Pentagon. Went outside, I was steaming. Mm -hmm. She said, who is your congressman? I don't know. So we went to the, the Library of Congress, and we looked it up, and we found it was uh, Brown, out of Urbana, Ohio, a Republican. Okay, we go to his office. I'm talking to his secretary, and he comes and stands in the door. I don't even know the man, didn't know who he was, now he's saying, listen. So he come in, and he said, you go back to Springfield, and you'll hear something from us in 48 hours. I walked on the left. Got in the car, I told her what the man said. She said, well, what he's going to do, he'll uh, make a call. And in the Pentagon, in that section, the lights were on and off, and a bell rang. And everybody, whatever they're doing, they stopped because they had to answer this man in so many minutes, so many hours, whatever he wants, Congressman. Well, anyway, I went on back. Well, I wouldn't go back to work with the company. I went back to work with my dad. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I was ashamed that you know, I didn't get the job, you know, for that. Right. So they sent a station wagon to my house a few days later from Wright Patterson Air Force Base. And I had put in for a GS-6. They gave me a GS-8 and created a position for me at Wright Patterson Air Force Base as a construction inspector general uh -huh. for um, uh, eight instead of six. But I didn't know anything about civil service or anything, you know. Hmm. And I just went on to work down there. And all of a sudden, the secretary had told me, don't let them put Building 800 on you. Everybody's having a problem with them. Well, that was a protocol room. That meant only for field officers, mm -hmm. majors and up. And they were making a remodeling. Well, I knew what my job was in this matter. 
So they'd come in every day, and the guy named Gray, he was the head of it, and we, they gave me a, a desk facing the wall right by the door. <laughs> and I noticed everybody would have a job. I had no job. They wouldn't give me no job, though. They'd go out and inspect. So one day I was sitting there, and what I do, I went home and I got some of my steel construction books out mm -hmm. and stuff that I had never covered. I copied truss diagrams, all the mathematics, and then I'd come back on this paper and angle it with the wall at an angle. Say 60 degrees, put it at 45, whatever angle I put, you know. And then I had business down the hall, and I'd go down the hall. Come back, paper been moved. I, I got you where I want you now, you know. <laughs> Meddling with me. Nobody wouldn't have nothing to do, you know. <laughs> so I had this meeting. They had meetings in the second room. But the gray would punch, the, you know, touch the guys, and they'd all go, I never was touched. Mm -hmm. So one day I got to think, I'm an inspector. Two weeks I sit there, nothing to do. I said, I'm an inspector too. And I got up and walked back there. And they was arguing about building 800. And I said, why don't you give me that job? The boy, Cook, he couldn't wait. Oh, here, take it. Give me the job. But Gray stopped it and said, no, uh, can't start you on that. So, so, so. I said, well, I don't have anything to do. And I said, uh, Cook don't seem to want it. Uh, Maybe he can't handle it. I said, you know, I just <laughs> let, <laughs> let, let me have the thing. I said, you want the job done? I said, I can handle it. So he said, well, go ahead. I hadn't been on it no time. Um, when weeks, when I mean, did you? Uh, three weeks, so. Uh -huh. I sit there. I didn't go. And a guy named Greg come in that day. And I'm still sitting there. What are they doing down in the protocol room? I said, oh, well, according to the log here, uh, um, they should be doing so and so and so and so. He said, have you been down? I said, I don't know where it is. <laughs> he said, come on, I'll take you. So he went down there, took a great big sign out there. Hmm. Well, he couldn't wait. Hey, called him superintendent, hey, come on. I want to introduce you to the new inspector. Oh, he couldn't holler. Hey, all the guys working on looking, you know. Hey, come on down. I want you to introduce me. Oh, he had it. Oh, he couldn't wait. All of a sudden, here comes the superintendent down here. Well, hello, Mac. How you doing? My long time. Who you know? He, <laughs> he said, Mac used to work for our company. <laughs> <laughs> so that did it. All right. Then that went on. But... The gentleman, see, one time the gentleman and his aide come in there. And the gentleman come in there, and they walked in there. And I, pardon me, sir, I said, this is a hard hat area. And I said, uh, the uh, building belongs to the contractor until it's formally accepted by the base. Well, the man, the, the general's aide almost had a fit. Hmm. You know, the general looked at me and so they, they walked on out. So when I got up, back up there, the loudspeaker was, system was gone. Gray to leave. They wanted me immediately. You know, um, Colonel wants to see us there. What happened up the uh, protocol? Mm, nothing. Well, the general wants to see you at 9 o'clock in the morning. I said, oh, all right. What happened? I said, oh, I don't know. My, Ten minutes to nine, I walked in like I owned the place. Had a big table down there. Aide was sitting there, and the general back there in his office. I walked in, looked over to Aide, and I said, Good morning, sir. I walked in like I owned the place. Huh. I had a big, heavy set of drawings, specifications, daily log. I walked in like I owned Boom. Dropped the drawings down and opened them. Put my specification here and the ball goes in, now I'm ready to fight. That's what I'm saying to myself. So the general got up and come in. Good morning. Good morning. What I want to know is 
What is, uh, how many means of egress do I have in this building? I, I said, here we are. I said, you only have, I said, down here, I said, your safety director has approved it for three. I let him know that his safety, his safety director, not, I didn't approve it, his safety director. I said, uh, but you only have two. Oh, 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 I see, you got here, you go, jump, you got here, you go, jump. I said, this is my, I think uh, he had in mind. I said, you gotta go through this door, around the range, and out here. And I said, a means of egress means direct exit of a building. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Well, thank you. Thank you. That's what I thought. Uh, thanks for coming down. <laughs> I went back. The colonel called me up. Let me see. What is this egress? <laughs> I told him. Well, I don't know. He said, I've been sitting to this thing a long time. I didn't know what it meant, but uh, I'm glad you did. <laughs> he said, I'm leaving here in a few weeks, uh, going to Griffiths Air Force Base in Rome, New York. He said, why don't you come, would you come up there and carry the ball for me? And I said, yeah. Well, I don't know how they got hold of it. They started this rift, reduction in force. I had no seniority in, in uh, civil service. I was creating, my job was created. Yeah. So I had to train the man, safety director, to take my job two weeks in order to continue, you know, mm -hmm. on the payroll. And then uh, they offered me a job through personnel in the laundry. <laughs> and I told me no. And I went home and I thought about it. I went back the next day and I told him I'd like to have that job because I got a way I had to have a job. They wouldn't give it to me because they smelt the rat. <laughs> I, I was going to make an issue out of it. Here I am, construction inspector with all the formal education <laughs> and they offered me a job yeah. sorting dirty clothes. <laughs> Oh, my. Uh, they, they were ahead of, they would give you a job. So then I put in for the transfer up to Griffiths. And uh, they sent back and said there was no opening for the time. So I saw them party that worked uh, at Wright Paris and they said, give me your papers. And they sent them directly to the colonel up there. And I went up there and I worked project supervisor, <laughs> for th 370 housing project. <laughs> <laughs> I stayed up there and I found out this isn't for me. <laughs> I said, to work for the government has to work in a clique. Uh -uh. I come on out there. So you returned to Springfield and yeah, I went, with your family? Went back to Springfield with my family and then uh, uh, my father, he passed on. I wouldn't, I wouldn't carry on with the business because I thought I wanted no more to do with it. It was too much of a strain on him, I thought. And, and uh, the work, a group of men, union scales and all yeah. that, and small town. And last job I ran was uh, Thompson uh, Sweeper Company. They do lawn sweepers. My dad mm -hmm. built their factory and, and I uh, ran that job. And I, get out of this mess. <laughs> and I, about that time the union was calling me and sent me to Scarlet Oaks Vocational School to teach. Yeah. I taught out there for 13 years. They transferred me from out here to Wilmington, 49 miles from my house. And they found out that this lady and I was riding together, you know, so they shipped her to Milford and shipped me back up there. And I, the, they had this meeting that day, and they said, "They said uh, you'll be coming back here, Mac." 
the superintendent and all of them sitting there, you know. They never heard me get loud or anything, you know. <laughs> so I pushed my chair back and I said, you know what, I'm going to be going to a damn place. <laughs> I said, you have my retirement statement by the 13th day of July. <laughs> and I retired. <laughs> but I was fortunate because I retired from the school system, Great Oaks school system, with 16 to 3rd years, and a total of 16 to 3rd years, mm -hmm. and then Social Security on top of that. Wow. So, single person. And I said, I That's was just it. That's it. <laughs> and, and I planned my retirement. Uh -huh. That day I told him, I said, you know, I said, you played your game. <laughs> and I said, I played your game with you, but I won. <laughs> and I did. Because the more time you had in, the more your pension was going to be. <laughs> and they thought I was going to quit because I had to drive 49 miles one way to work. Sure. And I stayed up there three and a third years in Wilmington teaching. <laughs> Well, you certainly have had a broad, broad, interesting experience in life. I guess I took and, up the uh, whole hour. <laughs> <laughs> we've just got a couple of minutes left here, Mac. Uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, you're living in Cincinnati now? Am I what? You're living in Cincinnati yes, I now. I live here. Maybe. Okay. And uh, our good friend Bob McGonigal, of course, is, has... Uh, been with you a lot, and uh, he's spoken so very highly of you. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's been a true honor to have heard your story. I must say, it's most unusual. Yeah. <laughs> it's an outstanding <laughs> story, and the different kinds of people mm -hmm. that you uh, were in contact with, and mm -hmm. worked for, and worked with, and so forth, and. Uh, uh, our nation is very grateful to you for what you did, your service, and uh, God bless you, and thank you for submitting yourself to the, the camera. Well, I appreciate the chance to tell it. <laughs> well, I'm so glad that we could do it, and uh, uh, we wish you luck and good health, and, and God bless you forever. All right, thank you. Okay.